All right. <laughs> Round two of day two, uh, Justin Chen and Neil Wadwa uh, both just finished PhDs at MIT and are currently postdocs there, respectively in the Laboratory for Infrastructure Science and Sustainability and CSAIL, the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. Uh, they're a dynamic duo developing computer vision tools that make images and films even more dynamic than you uh, could possibly imagine. And uh, this talk will be a special treat because I understand it will feature a live demo. Uh, I think it will be the only talk in the conference with a live demo. Um, I should say here I had the extraordinary honor of being Neil's classmate in college and Justin's classmate from elementary through high school. Um, and uh, while I wish I had something to do with their collaboration, I had absolutely nothing to do with it. They both landed at MIT and started writing uh, absolutely incredible papers, um, one of which I came across. And my thought was, oh, wow, my, you know, my, my friend Neil is working with someone who has the same name as my former classmate. Um, and then I realized it actually was, you know, sort of the, uh, they were both at MIT, and, and lo and behold, they'd run into each other. Um, so we're very excited to hear them uh, tell us about Smaller Than the Eye Can See, Big Engineering from Tiny Motions and Video. QED. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Scott. So uh, we're going to talk about work we've done on analyzing and revealing imperceptible signals and videos by magnifying them. So traditional microscopes were introduced about five centuries ago, and they revealed, they've revealed this beautiful hidden world of small things, showing us how crystals, materials, plant cells, and bacteria look like at microscopic scales. So in this talk, we're going to tell you about a new type of microscope, one that reveals hidden signals and videos by making them larger. It doesn't use optics, but instead uses ordinary cameras and computational processing. And I'll be upfront about the fact that even though this is a big data conference, this talk is not really about big data. We're going to tell you some cool things uh, that you can do without big data and maybe try to make some connections towards the end. So the reason why we need this microscope is that subtle changes are really important. If they're left unchecked, they could become large, like in this bridge you see here. And in this case, these large motions cause the bridge to collapse. So what you want to do is see these subtle changes before they're large. You want to magnify them, magnify them using our new microscope. In the case of this other bridge, we can take a video of a section of it, and, even, and uh, this video is playing even though it looks completely still then to reveal the subtle ways in which it's moving, we can amplify the motions. Now you can see that this bridge is also rocking back and forth, albeit at a much smaller scale. We can also apply this microscope to apparently static videos of humans. The human face and the sleeping baby look like static images, but they are playing. When we apply our microscope, uh, for small changes, you can reveal blood flow going in and out of this man's face as heartbeats when you amplify the color changes. When you apply um, this microscope to the baby, you can see her breathing motions, assuring us and our parents that she's still alive. So here are those two videos again. They were captured with ordinary DSLR cameras, and our te technique is entirely in software and can be used to process any video. So in this talk, I'll first go over how these techniques work. Then I'll show some results, and we'll give you a live demonstration at the very end of the talk. And in the second half, Justin will present some engineering applications of this new type of microscope. So how did we extract those color changes and amplify them? Well, to visualize subtle color changes, we just look at changes in light reaching the camera as recorded at each pixel in the video and increase them. We make them bigger so that you can see them. The tricky part is that those changes are extremely subtle, and we have to be very careful when you try to separate them from noise that's always present in videos. For example, consider the changes in pixel value at this point in the man's forehead displayed in the graph to the right. You can't really see anything resembling heart rate or pulse. However, if you average spatially, a bunch of pixels spatially near that point, you start seeing something that more closely resembles heart rate, as shown on the bottom right. You can make the signal even cleaner by only taking temporal frequencies that correspond to the human heart rate, say 30 to 240 beats per minute. And if you add the signal at every pixel back to the original video, you get the color amplified result we showed earlier. And this is not just a visualization, but we can also compute the actual heart rate. 
And we can do that with regular cameras without touching the patient. So what you see here is the pulse and the heart rate of a neonatal baby that is extracted from a normal video taken by a regular DSLR camera. And also the heart rate measured by an EKG monitor in a hospital. They're of similar accuracy. So the processing I've described so far is for amplifying tiny color changes in videos. But it turns out exactly the same processing can be used to amplify small motions in videos. So this is because the light that is captured by cameras changes not only if the color of the object changes, but also if the object moves. That is, by increasing the changes in intensities temporally, we can actually increase the motion spatially. So to illustrate this relationship between temporal and spatial changes, consider this one-dimensional representation of an image. The y-axis is brightness, and the x-axis is location or space. If the image profile moves to the right after some time has passed, the temporal change in brightness uh, is related to the amount of translation through the gradient of an image, just a first order of Taylor approximation. If we boost the temporal change in brightness at each point while keeping the spatial gradients, we essentially hallucinate a larger translation. And as I said before, this is a first order linear approximation to the magnified motion. You can see this illustrated on this 1D Gaussian image profile whereby only amplifying the temporal differences between translated Gaussians at different times, shown by the vertical lines, the Gaussian appears to move further in space. As long as the image intensities change slowly and the motion in the sequence is sufficiently small, the first order linear approximation will work reasonably well. So to borrow terminology from fluid mechanics, this method of only looking at variations at a single pixel is an Eulerian perspective of motion processing. An alternative to this is Lagrangian motion processing, in which the motions of particles or objects are explicitly tracked. This approach to magnifying motions was explored by our group about 10 years ago, in which pixels are tracked and motion vectors are amplified directly to synthesize videos with larger motions. You can see it being used here to amplify the motions of the swing set as the woman uses the swing. It works pretty well, but it's really complicated and it's hard to do well. It requires tracking the pixels, segmenting them into coherent motions, and filling, them, filling in the holes left in the videos after the motions are magnified. Our new Eulerian approach is much simpler and more efficient. Instead of tracking pixels and shifting them explicitly, we only process and manipulate the color changes at each pixel in the video independently over time. So here's another sequence in which we remotely take a picture with uh, this camera, uh, which flips its shutter, causing it to vibrate. You can't see that vibration in the input video on the left, but in the middle, you can see it. So to summarize how we produced that result, we took the input video shown as a cube on the left in which the extra dimension is time. We averaged the pixels together spatially in several different amounts to produce uh, a spatial decomposition of the image, then temporally filtered the intensities in that decomposition to clean it up, clean it up and added this uh, temporal variation back to the original signal to get the motion magnified result. It's a really simple pipeline capable of running in, capable of running in real time and revealing a wide variety of phenomena. So going back to the camera and baby sleep, sleeping sequences, you may notice that there's this graininess in the output video that is the result of amplified noise in the input video. You might also notice some intensity clipping artifacts on the baby seam in the bottom middle. Um, this is all because of the first order Taylor approximation. And uh, since developing this first technique, we've developed uh, new methods which result in the much cleaner videos now shown on the right. So the way these methods work is they decompose the image using a wavelet decomposition and look at local phase variations in that decomposition. I won't go into any of the details of these approaches, but you can find them in the citations at the bottom. Um, the bottom line is that they reduce noise in the output image and improve the quality of motion magnification results while still maintaining the efficiency and simplicity of the Eulerian approach to motion magnification. So now I'll show you a couple more results. 
So when a person tries to fixate at a point, their eye may still move from involuntary head motions or eye movements known as micro saccades. These motions are difficult to see even in this close-up shot of the eye filmed at 500 frames per second. But when we, when we amplify the motions 150 times, they become apparent. Even in a seemingly expressionless video of a person, there's a lot of information about their breathing patterns and small changes in facial expression that our algorithms, algorithms can pick up and make visible. We can also handle videos with slow long-term motions using temporal derivative filters. So in this sequence, we dropped a metal corner brace on the ground, and in the processed video on the right, we amplified the third time derivative of the motions by 500 times. This eliminates motion due to gravity and amplifies everything else. When the corner brace hit the ground, you could see the collision-induced vibrations. So when we, when we published this paper, we also released the code for it. And a couple people uh, posted videos of themselves using this code on YouTube. So here's one example by a YouTube user called Tomez85. We don't know who he is, but he used our code to amplify belly movements during pregnancy. Uh, a Yale School of Design student also tried to produce an art piece with this code. Um, she wanted to see if there are some inherent differences in the way her classmates move and filmed them while asking them to stay completely still and then magnified their motions. It's like seeing still pictures come to life. So uh, this is uh, Mickey, one of our former lab mates who also worked on this project. He's a talented singer. Uh... We zoomed in on his throat and took a high-speed video at 2,000 frames per second of him uh, singing that note. We also recorded with a microphone and uh, computed the frequency spectrum of the audio as shown on the right. It has a fundamental frequency of 100 hertz. If we amplify the motions in a narrow passband around 100 hertz, we get the following result showing his neck vibrations while he's singing. You can't see anything in the input video, but when you magnify the motions, you see something completely unexpected. So continuing, continuing with the theme of sound, we tried some experiments where we played a MIDI version of Mary Had a Little Lamb in a room with a bag of chips in it. <laughs> so the video is in the bottom right, and the sound that we played at that bag of chips is this. So what we did was um, that, that, that MIDI sound has uh, several notes in it. We produced motion magnified videos corresponding to the frequency uh, of frequencies corresponding to each of those notes. So we got four videos, uh, motion magnified videos uh, out of this and uh, produced this uh, visual spectrogram in which each motion magnified video vibrates with the song. And the obvious question now is whether this can be used to recover sound from videos. And the answer is yes. So in the case of the chip bag, here's the recovered sound from just the silent high-speed input video. So we didn't choose uh, the MIDI version of Mary Had a Little Lamb by coincidence. Those are said to be the first words that Thomas Edison spoke into his phonograph in 1877, which was one of the first sound recording devices in history. So today, 139 years later, we can get a sound in similar quality to that phonograph, but we can do it just by watching objects with video cameras. And we can do it 
even, you can even do it from 15 feet away behind soundproof glass. So in this experiment, uh, we filmed that bag of chips in the bottom right with that camera outside, and here's what we recovered. And uh, now I'll turn it over to Justin. All right, thanks. So a lot of the videos that we've seen have magnified the motion in a very specific frequency range of that object. And so I'd like to just go over a bit of the engineering behind that. So it turns out that things tend to vibrate in preferred modes, or, or eigenvectors, as you'd like to call them, of uh, mode shapes. And so what that means is that from these videos, when we're magnifying at a specific frequency, we're actually looking at an approximation of those mode shapes of those objects. Now, given that we can use the camera to also measure displacements, then we can process those displacement signals and also get the mode shapes in a quantitative fashion. And so what that might look like for a cantilever beam is like such. So you have a source video on the left recorded at 2,000 frames per second. And then if you magnify at each of these specific frequencies, you can see the different bending modes of each object. So the first one sort of looks like this. The next one has uh, one node in it where it's not moving. The next one's a little more wiggly and they get successfully more and more wiggly as you go down the line to higher and higher modes. Now we can also use this to look at mechanical uh, rotating machinery as well. So if we look at a car, this uh, one of my cars, a Honda S2000, and we record a video with a cell phone. And if we extract a little crop from the engine and then process the, the displacement information, we can actually see frequencies corresponding to uh, motions of the engine. And then if we actually look at the uh, motion magnify video of that engine, on the top left you see the source video, and then in the, next, in the other three corners you see uh, different frequencies magnified. So you can see the engine moving up and down at one frequency, uh, the engine with other parts of the engine bay moving around as well at, at the other frequencies. And if you look at a different type of engine, sort of a, a Subaru, which is a common car around these parts, you can see that instead of sort of the typical up and down motion because of how this engine is laid out, you can see the, the uh, characteristic rocking motion of a boxer or, or horizontally opposed engine. So why does uh, examining sort of machinery and, and uh, structures really matter? Well, in, in my field in civil engineering, uh, we have this large problem uh, all over the US of aging infrastructure. And so damaged infrastructure may happen due to normal in-service usage, environmental conditions, and uh, many other things. And currently, inspections are often just done by an engineer going there, maybe with a hammer, and looking at the bridge or structure with his eyes and saying, well, that, that looks about right, or you know, maybe he taps it with his hammer and it'll sound wrong. Um, but ideally, what you'd like to do is put sensors on it or use some sort of instrumentation to try and get data on whether or not uh, the structure is damaged. Now what's really nice with cameras is that instead of having to go to a structure and place sensors along it and wire it up, uh, you can just place a camera somewhere and record a lot of data from the structure. So the picture on our right is actually our uh, laboratory structure where you can see a whole mess of wires due to wiring that up. And you can only imagine how that gets worse for a very large structure. So the one point where big data may come in is that you can set up a lot of video cameras and record a lot of infrastructure and collect a lot of data on the vibration information from these structures. And then you can process all those displacement signals and whatnot into damage sensitive features and then apply machine learning techniques to try and figure out uh, when or what damage has occurred. So back to the cantilever beam example, uh, one place where the camera is particularly useful is measuring a lightweight structure. So if you imagine putting an accelerometer or putting a sensor on this structure itself would alter the dynamics of the structure. So by adding that weight, you change how it vibrates. But with a camera, you don't have to make, uh, you don't have to impose something on the structural system. And so we end up with this little source video, which is actually at my desk in my office. Uh, we can get the first two mode shapes of the, uh, the little beam there. And we can actually, in purple, we see the, uh, the frequency spectrum do from the camera itself, and then in red and blue are what happens when you put an accelerometer on the structure at different locations. And you can see that you get different frequency modes just depending on where you place the sensor. Uh, we can also look at different objects like this uh, cross section of a steel pipe where we recorded it at 5,000 frames per second and we hit it at the top of the hammer. 
and how that looks like when it vibrates and we make a motion magnified video. We have this for the first three modes where you can see uh, how the pipe is vibrating and it matches up well with uh, what we expect from literature. So what's interesting is that we can also use this on videos that come from anywhere, so YouTube, for example. And um, what's actually really interesting is that there's a building in Taipei, the Taipei 101, used to be one of the tallest skyscrapers in the world. And they have a tuned mass damper, which is, uh, let's call it a mechanical thingamajig at the top that keeps the building from swaying too much. And what's really interesting about this is that it's actually in a visitor center at the top of the building. And so people can go around and actually see this tuned mass damper. And what's really interesting is that um, during this specific earthquake that happened in uh, 2015, the security camera caught footage of this. And so we can take this input video uh, from YouTube and try and process it for information. So we can take that video, crop out the, uh, the large brass ball that is the tune mass damper and extract displacements from it. And what we can actually see is we see the, it's actually still, and then we can see some tiny motion correspond to, corresponding to when the initial uh, P waves arrive from the earthquake. And then after that, we can see the much larger motions uh, from the S waves, which are typically the motions that you uh, associate with an earthquake. And let's see. So if we wait in the video for a couple more seconds, there we go, now the S waves have hit. And so you can actually see the people swaying around as this earthquake occurs. But before that, there was actually motion that we could extract from the video showing that basically an earthquake was already on the way. And what's good and nice is that the information that we extract from the video, if we look at it in the frequency domain, matches what we get uh, from literature as well. Uh, so back to that bridge that Neil presented early on. Um, is made for a really nice example because uh, basically this bridge, which is a vertical lift bridge, the center section lifts up and down to let marine traffic travel across. And every time that lift section comes down, it actually vibrates the bridge. So that gives us a nice consistent forcing or excitation for us to make a, a video and uh, take data as well. And so we can go there, uh, bring a camera setup, actually probably the exact same, more or less the exact same camera used here. Uh, hook it up to a laptop and record video of the bridge from about 80 meters away. And uh, here's a picture of that where on the left we see the camera set up. It was drizzling that day, so it's uh, covered, the camera is covered by a plastic bag. And on the right is a screenshot from the recorded video. And simultaneously, a grad student from the University of New Hampshire was recording uh, the actual bridge motion information. And so what's really nice and I'm happy to report is that the vibration information as recorded by the accelerometers matches that which we can get from the video from 80 meters away. Now, if we go back to our, uh, go back to our lab, look at the plans, uh, we can actually sort of simulate what that bridge impact may look like in finite element modeling software. And so we can see, okay, so if we build a model of the bridge and force it in the same way, we sort of get those sort of same motions. And now if we look at the frequencies and the response from those motions, we can see that there are these, uh, these vibrational modes or frequencies that per participate a lot in the model uh, for how the bridge vibrates. And then if we compare those frequencies to what we've actually measured, we can see that they're quite close. And so this is actually one of the source videos recorded on that day. Um, as you can see, the bridge looks entirely still. You can maybe see traffic on um, 95 north, way in the background, but the bridge itself looks completely still. And so if we magnify things at one of its first resonant modes, we can see sort of this motion of the bridge. So on the left is a motion magnified version of that video, and on the right is the, uh, the simulated finite element model uh, of that motion. And if you magnify at a different frequency, you can get the torsional mode, that twisting motion of the bridge, which we see both in the ma motion magnified video in the video and also as predicted by our model. Now what's really interesting with these mode shapes is that uh, because they're eigenvectors of a mechanical system, you can use a whole collection of them as, and a linear combination of them to essentially generate a motion 
of the structure or object as it should be uh, in, in any situation. And so in other recent work that, we've, uh, that I did with Abe Davis, you may have seen this video online recently, is that um, you can capture a, uh, an object vibrating, the regular camera, and in this case, this wire figurine, and you can collect an input video like this. So as you can see in that input video, it barely looks like, looks like it's moving, and we've sort of, all we've done is vibrating it by banging on the table next to it. And then again, we select our uh, friends, those mode shapes, uh, and at specific resonant frequencies to try and build up a model for how that object should move. And so then using that mode information that we collected from the video, what we can do is simulate how that object should move if we were to apply new forcing to it. Now, because we don't actually collect any geometry information or mass information or stiffness information from the object, other than those mode shapes in the video. Uh, this is really only a plausible simulation, not a physics accurate one, but as you can see, uh, should be quite, uh, quite compelling. No, not me, not a live demo, that's, that's soon. And so you can also look at this jungle gym where the input is Abe kicking one of the supports and the result is uh, this uh, interactive dynamic video. All right, and with that, I'll turn it over to Neil for a live demonstration of motion magnification. Uh, I guess in the intervening setup time, I can take any questions for a bit, so. That's a perfect question because you've sort of encoded the answer right into it. Um, so there are, there are actually two major problems is that often what's built when you're building a new building is not what's in the plans. And so when you're building a new bridge, you wanna make sure after the fact that what you built is what you expect. So that way when you have a computer model as to how the bridge should uh, react, it's accurate so that uh, when, when let's say a hurricane comes along, the bridge reacts as you expect. And then the other big issue, which is probably a little more, in, is more interesting only because it's so pervasive is that a lot of the infrastructure in the US is from 50 or 100 years ago. So there's an awful lot of things to go around and measure and uh, if you had to place sensors on them, that would be basically impossible. Um, but if you can go around with a camera, just stick it somewhere, record 10 minutes of video, and then go on to the next one, it's much more doable. Okay. Uh the demo's all ready. Um, so one thing that we've talked about a lot in this presentation is uh, vibrations. And the thing about vibrations is that they're all around us all the time, but we can't see them because they're too fast and they're too small. So uh, as you might guess, uh, we can use motion magnification to solve the too small problem. Um, to solve the too fast problem, we can use uh, something that's kind of like strobing, where we shine a really bright light at uh, a wine glass and then sample the video at a very specific rate to cause its vibration to appear slower. Um, and you may have heard stories of, say, a singer singing at exactly the right frequency causing a wine glass to shatter. So what we're gonna do is play that frequency, in this case, 449 hertz, at this wine glass. And then, um, you'll hopefully see something interesting.
So you probably have never seen a wine glass move that much without shattering. Um, I'm going to play the sound again, causing the wine glass to oscillate. And you can see that the wine glass stops moving when I stop playing the sound, uh, which is a good sign. It means it's probably working. Um, yeah. Um, OK, and so for our final demo, I need a volunteer from the audience. Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Scott, I'd like you to sit in on that stool. Okay. Um, so we're going to reveal Scott's uh, respiratory motions, his breathing motions. Um, give me a second to adjust the camera. Sometimes they stop. <laughs> um, okay, Scott, I'm going to ask you to stay as still as possible. So even though Scott is trying to stay still, you can kind of see him wiggling a bit. It's a little dark, I suppose. Um, yeah. And you can see Scott breathing. Anyway, uh, thank you. You've been a great audience. <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, for frequencies, uh, we're limited by Nyquist uh, sampling limits, so half the frame rate of the camera. Uh, for the amount of uh, motions we can detect, um, it depends on the quality of the camera. Uh, we, we have analysis linking those two things, but typically for an ordinary camera, we can recover stuff as small as a hundredth of a pixel. Probably because that's true. Um, my guess is that cameras only became good in the last like five to ten years, and like th this project started around five years ago, about five years ago. Yeah, but I can't say for certain. That would be a cool application. Uh, I think our sensitivity is probably not high enough to do that, but that would be cool. Yeah, so if you had um, enough, if you imagine you already have a system of security or traffic cameras around the city, mm -hmm. um, that might be a really cheap way instead of having to involve, uh, install seismometers all over the city, is that you could just uh, look at the data feeds in real time and see if you see any, uh, any motions. But I suspect what you might see is big trucks driving by or, or the subway, as you can often feel in Cambridge. 